with the uh, Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Uh, very rarely do we hold um, briefings down, meetings down here, um, but we usually hold them on the Hill. But today I thought we were honored to have um, esteemed guests and visitors from Japan, and we wanted to um, have an informal roundtable discussion uh, with two leaders uh, on internet policy and technology from Japan. We thought it would be a great venue here, um, a convenient venue, um, for people to come in and talk. I appreciate for people that, um, from Ms. Baldwin's office who have come all the way from the Hill. Uh, we do appreciate that. And folks in the Department of Commerce, uh, Federal Trade Commission, and elsewhere, I really appreciate um, everybody coming. I just want to mention the microphones here. We, we record typically pretty much every event we do. We record and we, we podcast and we webcast on, on, the, on our website at netcaucus.org. If you'd rather not uh, have that webcast or either let us know and we'll turn off the tape or something, if there's anything you really, really feel like you need to say in confidence, uh, maybe you could say it afterwards or just let us know and we can, we can just strip that out. Um, I, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Mr. Yamashita uh, for helping uh, coordinate with uh, folks in, in Japan on putting this all together. Mr. Tanawaki, we're very honored to have you uh, today. Uh, we wanted to introduce, let me uh, make a brief introduction of Mr. Uh, uh, Seiko and Mr. Kobayashi. Um, we met Mr. Kobayashi several times in the past year. Um, as, as you may know, the Internet Caucus tries to foster dialogues with um, foreign um, leaders on Internet policy and technology. Uh, for several years now, uh, with the leadership of Congressman Bauscher and Goodlatte, we have a great dialogue with um, uh, the Internet Caucus in the European Parliament and, and in the UK as well. Um, and Senator Burns is a, is a real leader when it comes to reaching out to Japan and, and, and the rest of the Pacific Rim in Asia. So we're honored to have uh, Mr. Kobayashi and Mr. Seiko here today. Um, as, your, as your flyer notes that uh, uh, Mr. Seiko spent a couple of years at uh, Boston University where he rooted um, very hard for the Boston Red Sox, which is my home team. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Mr. Seiko formerly worked um, uh, at NTT, as I understand it. And he's a member of the Liberal Democratic Party, um, serves as a director of the Committee on General Affairs and the Investigation Committee. In addition, uh, Seiko san serves as the member of the Committee on the Budget and the Committee on the Establishment of Political Ethics and the Election System. Uh, Mr. Kobayashi, who um, addressed the Republican members of the Congressional Internet Caucus um, last seven months ago at the Republican National Convention event, uh, Technology Fair, the Internet Caucus put together, um, uh, leading the charge in Japan and putting together a, a counterpart to the Congressional Internet Caucus in Japan in the Japanese Parliament. So we're honored to have. Mr. Kobayashi, who is with the House of Counselors as well, and Liberal, Liberal Democratic Party. Um, he also serves uh, on Economy and Industry, Special Committee on North Korea Abduction Issue, and Related Director of the Research Committee on International Affairs. And we're very honored to have you both here. Thank you both for coming. Um, what I'd l we'd like to do is have um, just maybe some remarks mm -hmm. about uh, the state of the internet in Japan and, and related issues and maybe open it up for um, kind of an informal discussion and, and dialogue if that's okay. Welcome. So shall I start? Yes. Uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hiroshige Seiko and thank you for coming to uh, have some. Uh, I, I'm very happy to have this kind of a chance to meet you. And I am the first and the only member of Japan's Liberal Democratic Party who has experience to work for telecommunication industry. Uh, as, I, as he introduced, I worked for uh, NTT, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Co Corporation, for 13 years. And I studied in Boston University and got a master's degree. Uh, but you know, after the graduation, I had little chance to use English in my business. So sorry for my poor English. And uh, in 1998, I was elected as a member of the House of Councillors, and after that, uh, I mainly uh, acted in the telecommunication policy. Uh, especially until last year, I, I served as a parliamentary secretary for the Minister of Internal Affairs and Telecommunications, Mr. Aso, and I also I am now working as a director of the committee on internal affairs and uh, telecommunication. And uh, I did some registration uh, related with telecommunication, especially uh, 2002, I registered 
anti-spam law. Uh, it was very successful in Japan. And the night the law passed the diet, I had a chance to meet uh, Senator Barnes in Tokyo. And I excitingly talked about my law. And the law stimulated him. And he decided to legislate the same law in the United States. And uh, also, last year, I legislated a content promotion law, uh, which asks the government to uh, cooperate to the industry of the you know, games or animations or movies in Japan. And I also, this year, I'm trying to legislate a very kind of strange and uh, anti boyerism law. It's very serious in Japan. You know, there is um, some bad guys set a small camera in the toilet or bathroom and take a picture of the ladies and they distribute it through the internet. It's a very serious problem. So I am planning to uh, this kind of uh, anti voyeurism law. And I also have a, a lot of um, policy on the uh, telecommunication regula uh, regulation policy in Japan. And uh, until last year, Japan's focus in telecommunication regulation was an internet, uh, interconnection church. But you know, it's becoming uh, old fashioned. And uh, now the new focus on the telecommunication regulation policy is uh, how to accelerate the, bro uh, accelerate the broadband internet. Uh, especially, uh, we are discussing about three points this year. Uh, one point is uh, reviewing the uh, unbundled network element regulation uh, because uh, stimulate the uh, <coughs> investment to the optical fiber, uh, unbundled network element, UNE regulation is no good because, uh, you know, investor doesn't have an uh, incentive to invest their network. So uh, we have to review this kind of regulation, I think. And second one is how to keep universal service in the broadband internet service, especially for the rural area. It's difficult uh, for a telecommunication carrier uh, to establish, uh, to uh, construct the optical fiber in the commercial base in the rural area. So we have to uh, find some way, uh, especially to, uh, for the government, to support the telecommunication carrier to invest in the rural area. It's a very important thing. And the third point is uh, uh, contents. Even though we have a broadband internet, uh, in Japan we don't have very little uh, contents to you know, distribute through the internet. So uh, we have to stimulate the contents uh, industry. And that is the uh, uh, main focus of this year, I think. And the uh, uh, situation in the United States and Japan about broadband uh, sometimes different, and there is some a, a lot of difference because in Japan we have uh, some advantage of uh, because we have a very good uh, infrastructure of optical fiber network. Uh, United States doesn't, I think, but you know United States has advantage in the cable television network. Uh, in Japan, K CATB has uh, doesn't have very does not have important role in broadband internet. That's a very big difference, I think. But we have, uh, we also are facing the uh, same problem about the broadband internet. For example, how to deal with IP phones, or how, uh, how to keep rural, rural areas services, or how to keep the uh, services for the schools or uh, hospitals, or the, you know, uh, how, uh, how can I say, people with uh, low incomes. Uh, we are facing that kind of same problems. So uh, we are very pleased to exchange opinion with your caucuses. And I and Mr. Kobayashi is planning to establish the same internet caucus in Japan and would like to be a counterpart of your caucus. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Itaka Kobayashi also the member of the House of Councillors of Japan. Um, my original plan was that just uh, visiting uh, Kim Rodon, uh, three years friend of mine, 
uh, to exchange the idea of how to establish the uh, internet caucus in Japan. Uh, so I didn't expect <laughs> this kind of occasion. But um, as Mr. Seiko already uh, mentioned, uh, we are regarded as the uh, 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 diet member uh, who uh, uh, had some specialty in IT field. Um, Seiko-san is, has the background working for the uh, telecommunication company, and I myself uh, was running the IT venture before entering the politics. So, uh, and the, I'm visiting Washington uh, like uh, twice a year, these three years, and the main reason I'm visiting here is that to uh, study the, uh, e how the United States implement the e-government policy here, because actually in the field we are much behind, no, not only from United States, but uh, from the standard of the uh, world. So uh, we, I, what I found out is that uh, we have much to learn from U.S. experiences. Um, actually, um, we uh, are introducing some of the idea which already the United States has. Uh, for example, that uh, which uh, as the uh, United States got, uh, diet uh, that Congress is doing to praising uh, politicians in leadership uh, roles in uh, e-government implementation. And uh, now we already uh, creating a system based on the chief information officer process. So now we have the uh, chief, uh, chief information officer in every uh, single uh, government agencies. And also uh, we are thinking uh, it's very uh, important uh, to uh, set up the uh, uh, multi-party e-government uh, caucus within the diet, which uh, modeling the, your experience here. So um, I'm not sure uh, what uh, can we share today, but uh, maybe uh, seiko is uh, taking care of the uh, more uh, technical issues, <laughs> and I will take care of some uh, that organize, organizing processes. So thank you very much. Well, I don't know if it's inappropriate, but maybe we can all introduce ourselves, because actually there's a few people here that I don't recognize that, that may be new to uh, my organization. So, um, again, my name is Tim Lorden with the Internet Caucus. I'm Sergio Rodriguez, I'm with the National Journal, Technology I'm David Jepson, I'm with NTT Docomo USA. Stephen Mitchell from the Entertainment Software Association, we represent the New York Publishers. Transactions Association. I'm Kristen Mitchell with Congress and Tammy Baldwin. I'm Garrett Sermon with Every Cause. We represent college and universities. And for Bob and Computer Communications of Industry Association. I'm Kevin Browner from the uh, Service Committee of Industry Alliance. I'm Kevin Browner from the Service Committee of Industry Alliance. My name is Justin. You're working at the Japanese Embassy in Washington, D.C. originally from uh, social. Steve Trotman with CompTel Alt. Paul Green with the Center for Technology and Technology. Jonathan Kale from USDA. Who's Rodman with the Consumer Web Association? Charles Wilson. Rob Hogarth, NPT USA. Thank you. Uh, Mike Clark. And Mike Clark is our uh, all-around webmaster, IT guy, and uh, jack of all trades. So, Bob, can we, can we open it up for questions? I have several. Um, if you'd like me to break the ice, I'd be happy to. But if anybody has any questions for Senko san and Kobayashi san, uh, feel free. One thing um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Kobayashi, about e government, uh, uh, I think 
my uh, CDT is a real expert, Center for Democracy and Technology is a real expert on the government issues. But as I understand it, um, a lot of the government in the early part of the 1990s um, and the latter part of the 1990s was driven by an effort to get all uh, government information out on the web and, and make things as transparent as possible. Um, in 2001, um, the experience on September 11th, um, caused a reevaluation of some of that, some of those practices on getting the information out for cybersecurity reasons. Um, how do you see? Uh, we, so there's been a very difficult balancing of um, disclosing more information um, by the government in, in the government sense and providing more transparency for how the government works, and also not wanting to give up too much information that would aid terrorists and terrorist activities. How, do you see the same uh, uh, balancing problems with your e-government initiatives? And if so, maybe uh, you can tell us what those are. Um, yeah, as I told you that um, I have been visiting Washington to study about the uh, e-government initiative here. And, uh, as uh, Tim mentioned that uh, September 11th what, uh, has the big impact on the U.S. Uh, e-government policy because uh, after that uh, you have established the uh, Department of Homeland Securities which govern all the uh, e-government related and security issues. So um, actually, uh, we are advising our government to uh, introduce those kind of ideas because uh, that's, uh, you experience the same thing that uh, the uh, vertical silos of the, among the agencies is the hurdle for big, uh, high, Hurdle for implementing e-government issues. So, uh, actually, um, the in Japan, uh, the uh, two agencies or maybe three agencies is uh, uh, dealing with that IT issues. So, Songsho, uh, the which uh, Seiko Sensei is working for, is uh, in charge of that telecommunication issues and that uh, economic industry. Uh, agent uh, department, which I'm uh, working on, is also uh, dealing with that more um, like the uh, IT industry and the more competitiveness area. So uh, one thing we have to do is that to how to uh, overcome those kind of vertical silos. That's what we are now working on. Well, my, my second question, if there's any other uh, questions, my second question was uh, for Mr. Seiko, with regard to, um, you said that, did you say that there's no, cable television doesn't play as much a broadband role um, in Japan as it does in the United States, where in, in the United States, um, in many areas, there's head-to-head -head competition between um, former Bell operating companies, which is the, the incumbent, and cable television uh, companies that are providing broadband internet, and there seems to be some competition in those areas. Um, where do you see the? How do you promote broadband um, from a competitive uh, standpoint without two major players going head to head? Is it coming from wireless? What, what's where is the future? Okay, so especially the major competitor for NTT is an uh, electric power company in Japan. Okay. So uh, you know. They have telephone poles, or they have uh, underground pipes, so they are very, uh, they have big advantage to install optical fiber uh, in everywhere, especially in the western part of Japan, uh, I mean the Osaka area, uh, electricity power, electric power company has more share than NTT, uh, you know, in focusing on optical fiber, uh, broadband internet service based on optical fiber. So. Electric power company is the competitor. So NTT, I mean the uh, local telephone company and uh, uh, electric company will have a competition in Japan. Is does, is wireless? Um, uh, we understand. I understand that uh, Japan mm -hmm. is probably quite quite a bit ahead of us with regard to mm -hmm. broadband wireless. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. that also a competitive element? It or? may be, but uh, at this point, not because you know. Uh, wireless LAN, wireless LAN is not, uh, it's very convenient, but it, you know, area is so limited, so it may be a problem. But you know, uh, Japanese government will release a new license for wider area 
wireless LAN. We say uh, IMAX, WiMAX. Uh, so then the wireless service will be a very strong competitor for local telephone companies. Where is that spectrum coming from? Um, is it going to be released from maybe the Defense Department? From yes, that's right, from the Defense, defense Department. That's always been a, in the mm -hmm. past, it's always mm -hmm. been a struggle. And also, we are digitalizing the TV uh, frequency, so uh, there must be room after the digitalization completed uh, for the TV, uh, TV network. And when, when, that, when is that digitalization? Two, uh, 2011. 2011. 2011 is the limit for the analog service of television. What happens um, when that? Just out of curiosity, when that 2011 happens, for folks that don't have the means to have digital TV sets, um, how will they be able to get um, uh, over-the-air broadcasts in analog form? Will they have, will the government distribute? Uh, Maybe. Uh, we, we don't, at this point, we don't have any accurate plan, but uh, there is some possibility that the government will distribute some uh, set-top box, you know, the, modem for some user who, who can't afford, who, who cannot afford to buy a digital TV. Rob? In the United States, our definition for broadband is very modest. It's 200 kilobits. What is the definition in Japan? How do you, how do you measure broadband service in Japan? Uh, we count broadband service is not, uh, not by speed. We uh, count the broadband service by the uh, kind of service. So we count the ADSL and optical fiber broadband and CATV internet. That's a broadband we count. Mr. Siko, you mm -hmm. had mentioned before that y'all are reviewing your uh, unbundled network elements mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that you feel mm -hmm. as though it's a disincentive to mm -hmm. investment in optical networks. Uh, that's an ongoing debate in this country as well about mm -hmm. the effective use of unis. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see that going uh, in Japan? Because mm -hmm. uh, there are some of us that mm -hmm. feel that uh, an effective use of unis provides a more efficient uh, mm -hmm. deployment strategy mm -hmm. and that you can reserve your capital mm -hmm. until a point that you have the critical mass necessary to support that investment and that even the use of unbundled network elements is not done uh, free by any means, that there is a, a, a price to pay for that and that there, there is a, a, a recovery of that investment by whoever it is that deployed it. Uh, where do you see over time that review process going uh, in Japan? Mm -hmm. uh, at first, uh, in order to change uh, UNAE regulation, we don't need a review law. We don't need review law. Uh, you know, it can be done by the uh, government uh, ordinance. So maybe the SOM show can decide uh, how to deal with UNE. And uh, about two years ago, uh, LDP tried to review, uh, tried to force the SOM show to review uh, UNE regulation. But at that point, there are a lot of, uh, you know, of, uh, opposite opinion from the telecommun telecommunication industry, especially from the new common carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, situation is changing. Uh, there is uh, some consensus which is almost built among the industry. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, problem is that, uh, problem is uh, the carrier who invested for the optical fiber can cover their cost. That's the point. At this point, uh, in Japan's, uh, for example, optical fiber, uh, it costs almost uh, 15,000 yen per subscriber, but uh, uh, NTT offers for customer uh, for op uh, optical fiber service, uh, 5,000 yen per month. So they have a uh, 10,000 yen deficit for uh, offering service. And it's okay for customer, but entity has to uh, rent it to the competitor with the same cost, same price uh, to the customer. So that is not fair. 
and uh, you know the consensus is uh, getting among the LDP and the telecommunication industry that's too much. Uh, the, that kind of regulation is not good, uh, especially uh, our politicians are worrying about the especially rural service. Uh, you know, urban service we don't worry about uh, so much, but, uh, but rural service, who invest? It's a problem. So, uh, NTT invests. So we have to give some uh, incentive for them to invest to their network. So, situation is changing. Maybe uh, the decision will be done by uh, next March or so. Sekosan, just to follow on to that, could you maybe uh, explain uh, more about the current discussion in Japan on universal service, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the role of the diet versus yes. Somusho, and mm -hmm. in particular, what role you see wireless playing in universal service? Mm -hmm. uh, similar debates are going mm -hmm, on here. Mm -hmm, as you know. mm -hmm. Okay, um, first f about the universal service. Uh, we, uh, we have already installed a universal fund system, but it doesn't work at this point uh, because it's focusing only on telephone services and the other problem is the system is no good. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to explain the detail, but you know, uh, at least the system is no good. So um, this year, we will review the system of the uh, Universal Service Fund system. So uh, that is one point. And uh, also, the, yes, wireless network is very important to uh, solve the digital divide in rural area. Uh, but at this point, I think we don't have a clear plan how to use the wireless network in the rural area. We have some test case. We have some test case in Japan, but we don't have very uh, nationwide plan to utilize a wireless service for the rural area broadband internet service. Hi, um, uh, first I just wanted to mention, um, I think you might be my co-hi at Boston University. Yes. Because I was there from 1988 to 1992. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> at the College of Communications. <laughs> College of Communications? Oh, really? <laughs> about the universal service, mm -hmm. because I think it was in 2002 or 2003 that uh, the diet, uh, the LDP committee issued a resolution about the universal service in relation to the interconnection oh, charges. Yes. But there seems to be a misunderstanding that universal service means everyone gets the same rate in the whole country. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, but as you know, entity East and West have different costs. So... Um, but uh, that's been an issue with the interconnection. And without going into details, uh, what's your perspective on this? Especially, you must have been involved in that. Uh, I took a leadership at the uh, at the time uh, about that uh, but decision of LDP. About this uh, misconception about universal service, because this would play out again in, in uh -huh, broadband. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, in Japan, there is some common sense. You know, telephone charge is the same, all, you know, all over nationwide. It's very different from the United States situation. So at that time, uh, in LDP, we had a serious discussion. Can I change the cost? Can I change the price between eastern part of Japan and western part of Japan? And our, our decision is no, it's not good. So we decided to uh, request NTT to keep the same price. So that's the argument at that time. But uh, did that you mean keep the same price for the interconnection or for the retail rate? Interconnection, for interconnection charge. So, you know, because interconnection charge uh, give an influence to the consumer price. That's why we asked, we requested NTT to, keep, to offer the same connection charge to the competitor. Very unusual. I don't think any developed country interconnection is rising. But the retail rate is not going up. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. keeping the retail rate at about eight minutes mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. three minutes. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that the connection between interconnection and retail may not be 
so strong, and mm, also suggests mm, that mm-hmm. you could have different interconnection rates in different regions mm-hmm. that wouldn't necessarily mm-hmm. um, be reflected in the retail. Mm-hmm. Um, another comment, too, is it's not true that the rates are the same throughout Japan. In the rural areas, uh, your basic charges are Yes, yes, lower. that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's already a precedent mm-hmm. of different mm-hmm. charges mm-hmm. throughout Japan. Okay, uh, I, w- I totally agree with your opinion, and uh, uh, LDP's decision was very tentative. I think essential discussion should be done, should we divide local telephone company in two uh, companies? That's an essential point. Uh, because, you know, uh, Entity West has some uh, very big handicap, because they have a lot of rural islands, and, you, you know, so, you know, they can't be uh, efficient by, by, by themselves because they have a lot of rural land. Rural land means they have to install the, you know, undersea cable, uh, so it uh, costs a lot. So that's the point, I think. So at that time, you know, we can't discuss about, you know, two... 2002 was just after the NTT's uh, dividend, so uh, you know, just after the government decided to divide NTT in two companies, uh, so we can discuss about the unification of the two companies. So, uh, that, so the LTP decision was very tentative, and so this time, uh, I think it's person, my personal opinion. Uh, here, the time comes to discuss about the reorganization of entity groups, especially for local service. So are you suggesting maybe merging East and West? Again? Yes, but you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, argument should be done by NTT management. You know, mm-hmm. political side or government should not do that kind of discussion. NTT management should decide how they want to be, and they offer the plan, and we discuss. But there would be big uh, opposition. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree with that. Regarding the, uh, the margin of the NTT groups. But you know, in NTT groups, you know, long distance and international company and local service is divided. But you know, in United States, the uh, you know different movement is starting. And, and also the trend that's happening globally is, is convergence yeah. between the yeah. environment yes. and your Yes, 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 that's, that's, right. In, that's right. In the states, we don't have any structural separation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That. And that's, that's another issue, I think. Yes, yes, yes. yes. NTT Dokomos. So, you know, in Japan, uh, except NTT group, like a KDDI group or a SoftBank group, they have a, you know, vertical conversion for local services, long distance service, and wireless service. But NTT, only NTT is forced to divide uh, that kind of services. I think that is becoming the problem, especially uh, for consumers. Uh, as we noted in the, in the welcoming letter, um, the, this past couple of weeks, uh, the IT, International Telecommunications Union, ITU, uh, released its report, which causes a lot of chagrin uh, and dismay here in the United States about the rankings of different yeah, countries yeah, yeah, yeah. and broadband penetration. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the U.S. Um, Number two or three? Uh, so 16. 16. 16. 16. And it's only a top 20 list. So uh, <laughs> the U.S. is... On the, on the brink of falling off the list altogether. Uh, um, it causes a, a lot of dismay um, mm-hmm. among policymakers here, on the one hand, mm-hmm. 
On the other hand, some policymakers, regulators, say it's really not an important measure. Yeah. It really doesn't reflect, um, you know, the United States is a large, you know, continentally, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. large, yeah, a lot right. of rural yeah. areas, et cetera, yes, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Yes. Um, and some of the countries in the yeah. top tier. Uh -huh. Singapore dense, or, you know. Yeah, they're densely packed, they have uh -huh. piracy for entertainment uh -huh. services uh -huh. or things like that. Yeah. I'm not really sure. How did, did, does, do policymakers in Japan, are they, uh, are they as concerned with this IT report as um, policymakers are in the U.S.? Uh, some part we are focusing on that kind of report. Especially, uh, we are very pleased to, we, we are evaluated as the, Japan is evaluated as a country which offers the fastest internet with the lowest cost. So. Uh, we feel very happy about that, and we don't worry about uh, another evaluation. Uh, but you know, especially we, are, uh, what I am worrying about with the Japan situation, comparing with other countries in the world, is e-government. Our e-government service is far beyond the average of the advanced countries, so it's a problem, I think. The evaluation of IT programs of the countries different. Yes. Uh, by the, the different uh, the report by report. So <laughs> some of the reports say we are yeah. much behind, like uh, rank 20s, 21s, and other report maybe uh, may, made by the Accenture mm. here, and uh, that like government. Japan maybe for third or fourth. So and uh, as uh, Sekosa mentioned that uh, uh, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, the, actually, we, uh, we were much behind in 2000, and during these three, four years, we have much, pro, uh, much developed, so the service rate of the, uh, the DSL service is uh, reduced to approximately one third. And the sub sub subscribers of the DSL service was up to maybe eight times during these three, four years. Um, recently, the new subscriber to the DSL is stopping, and they are moving to optical fiber. We have almost three million subscribers in, for optical, optical fiber internet service. So where the US is at a, at a juncture where we're, a lot of consumers are switching from broadband, uh, from dial-up to DSL, mm -hmm. um, in many cases, you're in a situation where people are switching from DSL to, to optical fiber. fiber. And what, what do you see as the biggest reason for migrating from DSL to fiber? Um, why are consumers switching? Is it e-government? Is it gaming, entertainment services, movies? Uh, here in the United States, there's a big movement on uh, voice over IP mm -hmm. um, as a, a reason to get um, uh, broadband. What, what, what's driving Japanese consumers to adopt um, these high, high-speed internet connections? Just through that government enhance it. Mm. But the problem we have now is that, as Sekosa mentioned, we don't have uh, uh, the content so far. So the inf infrastructure is now ready, but we need some uh, more content. That's now the problem we are facing. Which do, uh, the factor which drives consumer from ADSL to fiber is price, I think. You know, the optical uh, fiber internet service is not so expensive. I'm using that in my house. Uh, 5,000 uh, yen per month. 50 US dollars. 5,000 yen month. per month. So it's very cheap. It, it has no difference between DSL service. So. Then speed is very good, so that's fine. But you know, uh, we are lacking contents, so we are struggling about that. Gaming is not so popular through internet in Japan. We are not like uh, Koreans, so gaming is uh, you know Japanese young people does game by Sony's machine, so they don't use the internet, and. What are your, what deadlines are you yeah, doing? Yes. We have good infrastructure okay. for e-government. Uh, almost 98% of government procedure is 
can be done through internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a good infrastructure for identification, public identification. We uh, issue the uh, resident card, which is called resident card. We can issue all over the country, even in rural village office, people can get the uh, electric ID card and they can receive the public ID identification services. They can, but you know, subscriber for that card is only uh, 300,000 300, people. It's a serious problem because uh, Japan has, Japanese people have some kind of strange uh, sensitivity for the pri uh, feeling of privacy. So they don't like to have that kind of service. We don't have a social security number, and uh, we don't have a taxpayer's number or something like that. So uh, that's a problem, I think. And uh, also, even though 98% of government procedure is, uh, can be done on the internet, but service is not good. It's very difficult to use. It's very difficult, uh, you know, uh, design of the home page or design of procedure through the computer is no good. So uh, when I was a, a parliamentary secretary for Somsho, uh, I ordered the staff to concentrate top 10 procedure which people use more to be convenient and friendly or something like that. And we are making effort for that. What exactly are you working towards in the area of e-government? Like what are the problems and what are, you, what are your deadlines? Um, now we are uh, introducing the so-called e-Japan Strategy 2, second, and that uh, target year would be the 2005, Five. Five. Yeah, next year. And that, uh, as Seiko-san mentioned, that we have that good, good uh, flat structure now, but uh, we are lacking of the maybe the perspective of the Sorry. end users. Mm -hmm. So the problem is how to improve the customer satisfaction. And another maybe target would be the how to uh, expand the uh, our capacity to the uh, international really. I mean, so we are now targeting Asia as a area to expand our uh, e-government and IT-related uh, capacities. Do you ever think you'll get to the point where you'd mandate, mandate that people have to have the national the electronic, electronic ID card? Would you mandate that everybody has to have it? No. No, no. Privacy. Yeah, privacy. And maybe the you know, cell phone ID system will be the uh, de facto standard for Japanese people to identify people. So maybe our uh, public identification system cannot win. Yeah. But there is, a, there is an authentication system? I'm sorry, yes, they have, they have. For the cell phone, there is an authentication system? Yes. Okay. You know, they, they have a new uh, type of cell phone, which, has a, which includes IC, uh, identification IC uh -huh. inside. And they have already started private service as a private service. Right, at the Internet Caucus Technology Fair, we have yeah. every year yeah, yeah, technology yeah. demonstration uh -huh. in Capitol Hill in the Senate, uh -huh. and um, NTT Dokuma showed Yes, uh, yes, that's right, that's it, that's it, yes, yes, e-wallet, e, -wallet. e -wallet. yes, that. yes, so that's, that's it, that's it. Actually, we don't have the social security number, so actually we have a big uh, discussion about uh, our pension system. But we are stuck because we don't have social security and because of the uh, privacy concerns. So uh, the, also we have the same problem with the uh, electric identification card. Japanese people doesn't believe in government, so <laughs> doesn't trust government. So that's a problem. So cell phones might be the way you track people? In yes, yes, attract people. Uh, for example, Japan Airline started uh, uh, to use uh, cell phone as a, you know, mileage card. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's so much as uh, tracking for uh, you know, uh, privacy, yeah. but that's the way you will access yes. service. Yes. It's, it's not a monitoring of yeah. wherever it is. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on 
how MPT Docomo perform good or whatnot. Your company. Yeah. Garrett? Uh, I think you answered this question given the Japanese culture, but are there, can you identify any industries in your country that are starting to adapt authentication technologies? For instance, here in the United States, the aerospace industry, pharmaceutical industry, clarification, we're all looking across certified with the federal government to collaborate on research in other areas. Do you see that trend in Japan right now? Or no, no, no. It's, uh, you know, by law, strictly uh, prohibited to use the uh, individual information which the government owns to be used by private service. There is very big wall. So you have the good excuse that is the security matters. So the Pentagon can develop something, then they can spin out to the private uh, industries. We cannot do that, those, those kind of things. But our industries, me, but our industries themselves start to develop so they can communicate with each other. Yeah, in, in, in some industry, like uh, consumer electronics, they agreed on that give, uh, that new DVD uh, uh, standard, for example. You know, the public identification system, which I mentioned before, uh, only can be used for the government service. It cannot be used for the private service. Toyota or other a home security company would have some intention to use it as a, you know, identification, but they can't. The law prohibits. That's a problem. With respect to the availability of broadband content, uh, I have a, a little bit of an introductory comment, but it will be followed by a question, I promise. Uh, the OECD is just several weeks away from releasing the first of its reports on uh, broadband content. It has been involved um, for at least the past year in the study of a number of different types of, of content uh, online, uh, tracing the value chains and projecting growth for the future. Uh, they have been studying discreetly uh, reports on, on music, uh, on uh, entertainment software, on, on video games, and also research materials as a, as a series of, uh, of first studies and are just a few weeks away from releasing their report on uh, online games as a driver for broadband. Uh, and for example, it documents the anticipated growth of the overall video game industry from its current $24 billion to nearly $55 billion by 2008 with uh, approximately half of that growth attributable to online gaming. Uh, and so it really is an extraordinary report that will be available in just a few weeks, and I, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to look for that. Uh, one of the things, though, that it seems to me comes out of this report uh, is the increasing uh, interdependency and interreliance of content industry on services industries and vice versa, that the content industry is vitally dependent on services industries to get this, this content out to consumers. And conversely, services industries are dependent on being able to deliver that content in a secure and reliable way in order to recover value from the value chain. Um, and so, uh, with that as a long introduction, my question is whether you anticipate uh, having an intellectual property component to your uh, coalition efforts going forward, your caucus efforts going forward. Okay, it's a very difficult question, and I'm trying to do something. And uh, uh, intel uh, intellectual light uh, in Japan, we made Sony, especially Sony, made a big mistake comparing with Apple. Sony established a very good copyright control system for the music, which is called OpenMG. Uh, you know, there is a memory stick, and uh, uh, Sony, Sony's system can control uh, how many times to copy to the memory stick, so something like that. It's very good and in intellectual system, but it's inconvenient for consumers. So that's why they lose the, in the portable uh, music system uh, to the Apple computer. And so 
We are discussing about, uh, at this point, uh, of course, to keep uh, copyright is very important, but uh, to make it convenient is also important for consumers. So that will be some point. And also, uh, in broadband network, we have to make a new rule for the users. You know, internet, no rule. But, you know, in broadband internet, there, are, there might be some rule will be necessary. For example, if the one people download very huge movies, the people around there cannot use internet very effectively. So there must be some rule to limit what the, uh, you know, uh, the size of the download at the one time. Uh, there must be some rule or security or copyright covering. Uh, that may be, uh, that should be, we will try some, making some new rules in broadband internet in Japan. Maybe technically or maybe by the registration. registration. Um, the Internet Caucus just a couple of weeks, maybe about a month ago, held a, a briefing uh, in, in the Capitol building on um, campaign elections and the use of the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Election Commission, uh, which is governs uh, campaign contributions and how uh, mm -hmm. uh, people relate to the parties and the candidates, um, was going to pass a rule, is, mm -hmm. is looking to pass a rule mm -hmm. probably about 45 days from now, mm -hmm. maybe 30 days from now, um, on on whether you know bloggers and mm -hmm. people with mm -hmm. websites whether yes. they should be considered part of the elec um, uh, contributions to the election pro mm -hmm. the candidates process and there's all these different rules on um, that are coming down the pipe on mm -hmm. how the federal election commission looks at websites and web communications and internet the way they look at um, advertisements on broadcast television and Television, etc. Um, are you having the same experience of looking at how the internet plays a role in election uh, campaigning and things like that? First of all, we can in Japan we cannot use internet for the uh, election campaign. It's prohibited by law. So uh, you know the situation is a little bit different. Uh, in Japan, we have a campaign period. For example, for my house. We have a 17 days period for campaign. So, so one day, uh, the government, uh, uh, which is, we say, the day of notification of the election campaign, then we have a 17 days, then we have the day of voting. So we have uh, 17 days. And during the 70 days, we cannot use homepage for a campaign. But you know, before uh, about four years ago, uh, we have to close our homepage before the day of notification. But I seriously discussed with the government. Uh, uh, I had a good idea. The politician who published the book, their book will be in the bookstore. People can see it. So we can use homepage before the day of the notification. We can change the you know contents and then we leave it. <laughs> People can watch. That's the same situation with the you know book publication. And the government agreed with that. Now we can you know use the homepage uh, before the notification day. And then we cannot change the home page, but we can continue to show, leave it, uh, leave it to be uh, seen by the people. That's our situation. Is that the official home page, your official government home page? No, no. No, no, no. It's private. Private. It's private. Camp campaign yes. home page. And the, the, pop, the rationale was so that to give equal information to people who don't have internet access? Or what, what was the possible rationale for that? Yeah. The <laughs> major point is uh, uh, elder, elder politicians <laughs> in, in liberal democracy. We are willing to use home page, but you know, elder people doesn't like home, use home page. 
So maybe the first thing what we should do after setting up the Internet Caucus, Congressional Internet Caucus in Japan is that to uh, improve those kind of, uh, actually, how I can say, we have the, uh, the, G the digital divide mm -hmm. among the generations and the digital literacy in the diet is very low. So that, that reflects those kind of regulations. So. You have to go back and look at it. Here, didn't they give everybody a Blackberry at one point? Yeah, 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 yeah. They did, so, and it was, it was incredibly influential on how they yes. imagined email and understood. Very important. It's, it's in interesting that, uh, as you may know, that uh, Korea, uh, in the political campaign, they are using those kind of internet uh, effectively. So. I think we probably have one question. Mm -hmm. One last question. Uh, one issue that's starting to percolate in the United States is the issue of discrimination on broadband networks. Uh, we had a case where a broadband provider uh, apparently stopped someone from using the VUIP service on his network. And uh, we don't really have explicit rules. We have to see where it is. The user should be able to use the broadband connection for mm -hmm. his VUIP mm -hmm. service. And other uh, companies are also very worried about the broadband At this point, not. But you know, when I legislated anti-spam law, there is some uh, discussion because uh, I first I planned to ask the internet provider to stop the internet service uh, for the send to the sender of the spam mail. But you know, I can I couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, because of discrimination. So your rules currently prohibit. Yes. yes. You know, in Japan, tele uh, especially uh, NTT law says NTT has to offer uh, fair and uh, you know, equal service to nationwide. So for NTT, it's very difficult to make discrimination. Do they want to discriminate? No, I don't think so. Because uh, uh, someone who has the broadband, for them, it's good money, right? Uh -huh. I have my content, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can only get to my content uh -huh. if you use my service. Uh -huh. It's a, a good business strategy. Uh -huh. The other question is, um, there's a situation where a new service, um, a WiMAX service, I think it's called uh, Clearview. Uh, Clearwire. Clearwire. Um, it's a former Craig McCaw, it's a Craig McCaw company startup, and they're, they're just launching a service. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, this at the outset, this is a new service, we need to invest in this network, it's going to be capital mm -hmm. intensive. Um, we want, uh, we're not going to accommodate um, what they, I guess, call high broadband, sur uh, high broadband intensive services on it, like VOIP. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that at the outset. Um, they're a new service, they're certainly not an incumbent, they're using a new technology. And the question is, is it okay for them to discriminate against um, a, mm -hmm. a voice over IP provider mm -hmm. and, and block those particular calls? I think that's a, it's an interesting question that, yes. that regulators and lawmakers are facing here. Mm -hmm. I see. At this point in Japan, there is no discussion about that, so we will watch it. Well, uh, Seiko-san, Kobayashi-san, I, I really want to thank you for showing up today, and I applaud your efforts to, to form an internet caucus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.